All right, it looks like we've got uh, quite, a, quite a lot of people that have joined already and a uh, few more are joining at, as we speak. Uh, let's go ahead and get started this morning. First of all, thank you everyone for taking time out of your day today to jo join us. Uh, my name is Randy Anderson. I manage our cybersecurity and IT consulting uh, department at Loeffler Companies. And uh, this morning we have some um, from the trenches discussion uh, featuring Thomas Blade from Arctic Wolf Networks. And then uh, once Thomas is done with his presentation, I'll, um, I'll take over and give a little bit of the Loeffler perspective, some of the things that we've seen in 2020. Uh, we also have Greg Klingelhutz from uh, Arctic Wolf Networks. Greg will be uh, monitoring the Q&A. Uh, and throughout this uh, presentation, if you have a question or a comment, please put it into the Q&A. And uh, Greg will be monitoring that. And if we have a break in the conversation, Greg will pipe in. Uh, I do understand too that Greg is giving some, uh, some incentives for good questions or even not so good questions this morning. So go ahead and participate there. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, first Greg for a little introduction and then uh, over to Thomas for the presentation. Thanks, Randy, and uh, Greg Klingelhutz, the channel account manager here at Arctic Wolf. But uh, as Randy mentioned, Please put your questions in the Q&A chat section. We're gonna be giving away a $25 Amazon gift card uh, to five questions that are asked throughout the, the presentation. So keep those questions coming in. Every question that comes in will get put into the drawing and we'll uh, do a random selection after uh, the conclusion of the presentation and send out uh, the gift cards to lucky winners. So uh, keep those questions coming in. We'll make sure we get them answered, uh, whether in the chat or, or live uh, throughout the webinar. Over to you, Thomas. Fantastic. And I guess uh, I can't submit questions. I'm not eligible, Greg. Is that right? You are not eligible. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, that was also my microphone check to make sure you could hear me. Uh, one time I did a presentation for about 20 minutes and I was on mute the whole time, but everyone was so Minnesotan that they didn't want to tell me and interrupt <laughs> me. So, um, that being said, again, yes, please go ahead and put those questions in. Um, I'll have some breaks here towards the end to, uh, to get those answered. So um, today here, what I want to uh, share with everyone, as Randy mentioned, we're going to talk about some notable 2020 breaches. Perhaps you're going to probably already think of what they're going to be. Um, also, I want to share with you Arctic Wolf's approach to operationalizing security and really what that means. We're gonna look at some stories from the field. These are stories from our security operations center. So these are actual customer stories I'm gonna share with you. Uh, I have a feeling that some of them might be uh, a little relatable. And then we're also gonna get those questions answered. So Greg will uh, shout out some of those questions here as well as probably answering a few in the chat here as we go. And because it is a uh, work from home uh, lifestyle, I'm sure everyone has had to make, make apologies while they're working from home from a, uh, something in the background. So if you hear a little dog uh, snoring in the background or barking, I do apologize. Um, that's just the way that uh, 2020 has been and, and uh, continues here. So, so let's get started. Um, I think everyone kind of already knew that this one was going to be on the list but I'm going to briefly discuss with you uh, the SolarWinds Orion breach, keeping in mind here that this is uh, still ongoing. We're still learning a lot about this, but I do want to share some, some uh, co components here. So first of all, uh, what makes this really interesting, other than the fact that it is a major security company and it's a very large incident or large uh, attack, is that it is a supply chain compromise. So what was effectively done here was malicious actors gained access to the SolarWinds software update platform to distribute malware. So effectively malware or Trojan known as in this case Sunburst uh, was disguised as an update. It came through usual update channels, usual, usual software update channels it looked like a SolarWinds config file, and therefore the tools that we all have in place weren't really looking for it. We don't tell our firewalls to block 
software update, trusted software update traffic. And we don't teach our anti-malware tools to scan trusted configuration files. If you look at my timeline below here, that kind of describes what we've seen so far, um, you'll notice that it started all the way back in March of 2020, but we really didn't start to see anything come from it for a while. And that's because it was deployed and then it laid in wait. As part of the strategy to go undetected, uh, we saw that it didn't really uh, kick off anything or, or do any damage for a little while there. In fact, it wasn't until unusual patterns and activity were discovered that we were able to link it back to this actual uh, sunburst trojan. Now, again, this is an ongoing investigation, so we're still learning about this. Uh, but that being said, I do want to call out that neither Arctic Wolf nor Loeffler were uh, subject to this attack. But if anyone on the call here this morning was part of this uh, or thinks they may or has solar wind somewhere in their environment and maybe has turned it off but wants to discuss what to do next, please feel free to reach out uh, to either Loeffler or Arctic Wolf and uh, would love to kind of really dig in a little bit more with you on this one. The next incident I want to share with you, um, it, it might not be as notable. Uh, this one kind of went a little, um, little quiet here, so perhaps some folks on the call haven't even heard this one yet, uh, but malware bytes. So the same tool that perhaps folks on the call are leveraging to protect their systems on their network, that organization was also part of a breach. Now, I do want to call out that this was not impacting the tools or the software that malware bytes creates. So if you have a malware bytes on your agent or agent, excuse me, on your system, um, that was not the target here. But rather, malware bytes claims that the same nation state attacker involved in the solar winds breach also targeted them. So after they dug in here, it turns out that the bad actors leveraged privileged access in Office 365 and Azure, ultimately gaining access to a limited subset of internal company emails. So to sort of walk this back here, starting off with detecting suspicious uh, activity inside of Office 365, it wasn't until deep diving into not only Office 365, but also on-premise systems that attackers it had been discovered had uh, leveraged existing admin credentials in the system to gain access to that email data. Now, I bring this up for a few reasons. First of all, um, it is a, a, a notable name, right? A lot of us have heard of malware bytes, but I also brought this up because it involved a cloud-based system. So we see this and we think, oh, Office 365, Azure, that's Microsoft's platform. They are monitoring it. They are ensuring it is secure. And while to an extent that is absolutely correct, Microsoft, in fact, were the group that notified Malwarebytes of this unusual activity, it's not clear how long it went before it was detected. Um, and also effectively the attackers had what is a username and password. They were able to gain access to that data. So while Microsoft is protecting the infrastructure, the systems underneath, it is still up to us to continually monitor and ensure um, that that system is not um, compromised. So let's look at these two incidents. And we classify these not as product failures. Again, the firewalls in the SolarWinds Orion breach, they did not say, oh, that's, that's traffic from SolarWinds. We need to block that, right? Um, in the case of Malwarebytes and Office 365, someone didn't break into a uh, data center and, and physically access, but rather they gained access via somewhat legitimate means. They gained access through admin credentials. So these are not product failures, but rather operational failures. 
we didn't know what to monitor. We didn't know what to check. We didn't know to keep an eye out for other suspicious activities. So this is really where Arctic Wolf's security operations approach comes into play. So what, what is a security operations approach, right? It's not buying more tools. It's not installing more services, more software, more hardware, but rather stepping back and using what you already have. So first of all, the five tenants on the screen really describe that approach. And the first one is broad visibility. Uh, a number of my colleagues like to say, you can't protect what you can't see. We can't solely monitor one element of our environment without looking at everything else. In the case of, a, of the SolarWinds Orion breach, login anomalies and suspicious login activity was really what helped tie it back to that incident. So we need to monitor that entire environment, not just what's on premise, but also what is on endpoints. And in the case of Malwarebytes, what's in the cloud as well. Uh, we also need to do this on a 24 by seven basis. I think this is pretty self-explanatory, um, but we don't wanna shut our security off just because it's the weekend, just because it's five o'clock and we're going home. Uh, so the Arctic Wolf Security Operations Center that I'll dive more into here in a little bit, uh, never sleeps. And what that means is that the broad visibility all of that valuable telemetry and data coming from an environment that is being monitored is being analyzed in real time on that 24 by seven basis. Now, another element to the security operations approach is access to expertise. Now, this really tells, uh, really means that we don't wanna go out and hire more security engineers, right? Um, we don't wanna hire security engineers who can run the platform for us, uh, but rather being able to access expertise, uh, whether it's for customization of security monitoring, uh, deep dive investigations. Uh, maybe we thought we were part of some sort of attack or breach and we need to do retroactive hunting against all that valuable data from a forensics approach. And also we need to have them available on demand. Uh, so I'll talk more about how Archer Wolf addresses this here in a moment, um, but it does dovetail here into the final two tenants being strategic guidance and continuous improvement. So aside Thomas, from sim, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Thomas. We've we've got a, quite a number of questions in the uh, in the chat right now. I'm wondering if you have a time where we could get caught up on a few of those. Sure. Yeah, Greg or Randy, if you want to go ahead and 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 put a few of those out there. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, go ahead. Yep, so we got one in from uh, Benjamin Dory. Uh, do you foresee the SolarWinds attack changing the way those types of updates are scanned in the future? It's a great question. Um, the short answer would be yes. I think we will see changes to the way that not only those are scanned, but also how they are distributed. Um, more more on the up, up, sort of up the chain in terms of hardening that update process to make sure that it's not taken advantage of so that, you know, we're, we're, we're double checking what's being submitted. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to see a lot of changes there. And then the next question we have, um, are you going to discuss how these breaches can occur? For example, can opening an email with an attachment cause this to occur? Yeah, absolutely. I will, I will discuss that a little more in depth in terms of some of the attack vectors that are being used and more importantly, how we can monitor and, and uh, protect against that. Perfect. And then how can we determine if our firm was affected by the Malwarebytes breach? Yeah, so let me um, kind of repeat there a couple points on that Malwarebytes breach. Um, the actual Malwarebytes product was not subject to that breach. So the service that they offer, the tools that we've you may have deployed were not compromised. What was compromised was uh, um, Malwarebytes' Office 365 tenant. So their internal email. Now this is, has of course since been rectified, 
but I wanted to really bring it up because it speaks to the need to continually monitor the entire environment, not just what we own and what we can touch in terms of physical on-premise, but also upstream in those hosted providers. Um, the next question we have in this SolarWinds case, where em uh, employees would not likely be able to detect this as suspicious, what might be a preventative measure for the future to avoid this? Presumably, if people were aware of all known updates, this would be detected as suspicious as there wouldn't have been a notification for it. Yeah, uh, great question. So kind of walking back through what was seen with the, the attack with SolarWinds, um, the, the rants, or I'm sorry, the, the, the malware, um, it, it didn't do anything terribly malicious when it was first deployed on systems, right? I mentioned it laid in wait. What it did do is it sort of started to scan environments and try to determine, well, where am I? What do I have access to? What can I traverse? Um, and it was that traversal activity that ultimately led to detection. So um, if, if, if someone logs in legitimately into a service and then later on, maybe a few minutes prior or after that, a suspicious login is detected for that same user account, but now we're seeing things like anomalies, maybe locations that it's logging in from, for instance, um, that unusual pattern is what we're looking for. And that's what in this case tied back to discovering that, in, that uh, initial incident. Thanks, Thomas. And then another question, if, <clears throat> if the security tool themselves are being used as a delivery mechanism, are AI-based tools able to discover? If not, then would the only after the fact solution be to monitor for UEBA or abnormal network traffic? I don't think there's ever gonna be a time where we don't wanna monitor for that unusual network traffic or that unusual um, end user behavior. Um, not just in the case of what we saw with solar winds, but at a more broad level as well, um, that can be indicative of any number of attacks. In terms of AI systems being able to detect that, again, looking for those patterns is what an AI platform is really geared to do. Um, it's, it's to analyze all that login or log activity and look for unusual patterns. Um, so I, I don't think there's ever going to be a time that we don't want that. But um, this just kind of really shown a, a, a pretty big spotlight on that need. All right. There's a couple more, but uh, maybe we can hold these, um, continue on with the presentation. And then uh, next pause, we can answer a couple more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think some of these questions are great in terms of the need not only for putting a, a solution or a service in place, but the ongoing need, and Randy will speak to this here in a little while as well, but for ensuring that we're continually looking for these new attack vectors, that we're protecting our environments against these new attack vectors, um, and really deep diving into the solutions we have in place to ensure that they're being used as effectively as uh, possible. Um, the, if you'll forgive the, the, the pun here, uh, security is not a destination, right? It is a journey. We need to be continuously aware of threats and making sure that we're protecting against them. Um, so that security operations approach really ends with, again, that strategic guidance and ongoing or continuous improvement. <clears throat> So I want to break each one of those kind of down here for you and explain how Arctic Wolf addresses those. So the first one being access to expertise. So Arctic Wolf delivers what we call a concierge security team. And that concierge security team is designed to be the, a group of named resources for our customers who can then be leveraged for advice, ongoing security reviews, really being that, that human interface to a technical service. Um, so being able to do things like proactive threat hunting, looking for suspicious anomalies in the environment that could lead back to something like, in this case, perhaps a solar winds breach. Being able to add context 
to an incident. So if there is something that we see in the environment, being able to determine, you know, was there lateral movement perhaps? Was there data exfiltration associated with that? But having this, this team of resources that you can call upon rather than being able to um, maybe just open a ticket or, or, or lob an email out. Again, these are folks that you'll be able to engage with directly. <clears throat> so the services delivered here by Arctic Wolf um, to, to address the other tenants of, of the operations approach. The first one is managed detection or response or MDR. Um, and I wanna talk about that first thing in the corner there, broad visibility. So broad visibility means that we want to gather log data, meaningful log data from an entire environment. So some examples here, network traffic. The question was brought up earlier, being able to detect things like if someone clicks a suspicious link, right? We wanna be able to detect that. Perhaps it's phishing, perhaps it's a malicious download. We want to be able to detect that at the inflection point. So by having broad visibility, by having things like network uh, traffic monitoring, we can see that uh, at the onset of that event. Going further into broad visibility, we want to start gathering relevant logs from systems like an uh, Active Directory. We want to be able to look for suspicious logins or unusual behavior or patterns that could be indicative of maybe a brute force login attempt or uh, network traversal from something like, in this case, the SolarWinds um, malware. Going even further, we also want to incorporate log data from third-party services as well. So Office 365, for instance, we want to be able to monitor for suspicious anomalies or login behavior um, inside of those third-party services as well. Uh, again, we do want to do this on a 24 by 7 basis. So constantly monitoring the output of those log systems. And when something is found, we want to be able to triage it properly. I mentioned this earlier that Arctic Wolf doesn't simply forward logs out. Right? We don't just send you an alert, but rather we need to do a few things first. We need to validate what we're seeing, right? I don't want to simply send you an alert when a user clicks on a malicious link if the ensuing malicious download was blocked. Maybe endpoint security already blocked that particular malicious download. But if it didn't, I certainly want to escalate this to you and I want it to be meaningful to let you know, here's the user that clicked on this malicious link. Here's the context behind what they clicked. Here's what we saw in terms of investigation. And most importantly, as part of that triage process, I wanna provide guidance to remediation. What do I need to do? How do I need to respond to this incident? Arctic Wolf also wants to act on your behalf as well. That's the managed containment function that, I'm, uh, that you're seeing on the left side of my screen. Being able to effectively block that malicious traffic being able to quarantine an infected asset on your network. All these kind of make up that managed detection and response service. I'm gonna share with you a stat in the bottom right and then later on, I'm gonna kind of come back to that. But 70% uh, of new customers that Arch Wolf brings into the fold have latent threats that are found when managed detection and response is uh, deployed. So we need to look for that persistent or unusual traffic. Now the other service brought by the Arctic Wolf security operations approach is managed risk. Now managed risk is a little bit different from MDR. Managed risk is a vulnerability assessment system designed to scan the entire environment, so again, broad visibility, scan the entire environment for vulnerabilities, and then provide detailed guidance in terms of how to best resolve those. So scanning inside the network, anything with an IP address, we wanna be able to determine, are there vulnerabilities present inside the network? Externally as well. 
scanning things like the WAN side of your firewall, the public IP addresses that you run, being able to scan web portals you might have established for customers or end users. Also scanning for leakage of data out on the dark web. You know, was a, was a, a corporate user part of some third party data dump or some breach and now their username or password or data is associated and, and available for purchase out on the dark web. So being able to find the, these vulnerabilities or these risks, elevate them in terms of visibility so you know that they're present and provide detailed guidance in terms of remediation. The concierge security team is also layered in here because you know I would love to say, all you gotta do is install a patch and you're good. Right? All you got to do is install that uh, Windows update and this vulnerability goes away. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Right? We have to discuss other strategies. Maybe it's an order of operations. We have to put a plan in place to effectively resolve this larger incident. Maybe we need to discuss other strategies like that particular system can't actually be updated right now. So we need to move it somewhere else on the network to reduce that risk. And finally, the third kind of component here to tie off on the operational approach is managed cloud monitoring. So again, ensuring that we are monitoring those third-party systems that we leverage. Office 365 was an example I've already given. AWS for Amazon or Azure services. Being able to, again, scan these environments, looking for any anomalies, looking for any risks, being able to identify them, but then again, also being able to properly remediate them. So if we see unusual logins or suspicious downloads inside of Office 365, let's determine what's going on. Let's gather context. Let's escalate that and then determine how do we need to resolve this? Do we need to reset passwords? Do we need to have conversations with end users who are clicking those links perhaps. We need to talk to them about security awareness training. <clears throat> Greg, I'm gonna pause here. Um, I can see from the toolbar that perhaps there are several more questions popping up. Um, I do wanna share some stories with you, as I mentioned, some stories from the field, but before we get there, I'll take some more questions. Yep, there's a couple more questions that rolled in. Um, so with 24 by 7 coverage, is there a function whereby users can report suspicious looking activity to an agent? Oh, okay, got it. So yeah, by running 24 by 7, what Arctic Wolf is doing is the entire output of your environment. So log data, um, endpoint logs, network traffic, anything that falls under that broad visibility is subject to real-time analysis. So we're looking for these strange patterns and ultimately triaging those and escalating as appropriate. In terms of being able to self-report something unusual, that would follow some internal process where perhaps someone would open a ticket and ultimately be able to escalate that to Arctic Wolf. In terms of being able to call something out as an end user on my endpoint, that, that's not, that, that wouldn't be necessarily be a function um, where we would cut out the internal IT process. Thanks, Thomas. And then a very valid question, Kansas City or Tampa Bay? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that one safely. So Greg, I'm gonna defer to you. I've got a great answer. I think the most operationally sound team will win that game. And I don't know how you can argue with uh, the GOAT, Tom Brady. I, I'm pulling for him. I, I want to see uh, greatness happen. I know Patty Mahomes has a long way to go, and uh, Tom's in the twilight of his career. So that's my stance on, on that question. Um, next question, is there a specific industry that is more vulnerable to these types of attacks? Uh, banking, government, question mark. Yeah, yeah. You know, a couple ways to look at that. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear, well, no one wants my data. You know, we're we're X Y Z. We're small. No one want. No one. No one's bothering to touch us, right? And you know, looking back historically, that may have been true a number of years ago. But what we're seeing now is that attackers will cast a very broad net, 
very wide net. They're look, it's, it's a numbers game, right? If I, the question was brought up earlier in terms of phishing and malicious links. If I can throw that email out to a hundred or a thousand part, uh, uh, potentials and get three responses or three hits, that's good. So I'm not necessarily concerned about who I'm, ne- I'm targeting. Now, the flip side of that, the really targeted industries where people are are gunning for them, if you will, um, you know, there, there certainly is a lot of activity in, in the finance verticals. There's a lot of activity in legal, um, inside of government or state and local government. Um, anyone who has access to sensitive information can often be the target of those more focused attacks. All right. Uh, one more, and then we'll probably want to dive into some stories and I can answer yeah. some other questions. Um, so does Arctic Wolf only provide the SOC services uh, as well as all the security tools slash SIM, or do they leverage our existing tools and adjust the logs for your team to correlate and investigate? Yeah, great question. Whoever asked that, I appreciate it. That's a very, very technical focused question. I, I like that. So Arctic Wolf brings a number of components underneath that SOC umbrella. So SIM, for instance, was mentioned being one of them, the ability to not only collect that data, but also be able to work through and determine what we're seeing. Um, So when it comes to deploying the Arctic Wolf services, we do wanna leverage the tools you already have in place, the firewalls you already have in place, the endpoint security, the active directory, the cloud services, all of these are generating really good log data we want to ingest that and be able to analyze it as, as described. Thanks, Thomas. I think uh, to keep things moving along and make sure we cover all the content, uh, we'll have you keep going. And then um, if we have some time at the end, uh, we will continue answering questions. Keep them coming and they're, they're great questions. Yeah, I certainly appreciate it. So. What I'm going to do now is share with you some what we call stories from the field. Uh, internally, with my uh, other engineering um, uh, counterparts, we like to call them war stories. Um, and that's because these are actual stories from our security operations center teams. So these are stories that have affected real customers. And I think that they're going to be a little relatable as well in terms of, oh, yeah, that happens in my environment or we have an auditor on site that does that. Um, So I'm gonna walk through the events and point out what Arctic Wolf sort of started the investigation on and ultimately kind of show you how that uh, story played out. So the first one here um, is classified as an insider threat. And you're gonna see really quickly why, um, but it has to do with crypto mining. Now, Even if we remove that insider threat, this is also a misuse of company property, whether it's internal or externally done. So let's walk through here. Um, IT staff member using production server or probably servers to mine Bitcoin or mine cryptocurrency. Um, It's a little dated looking at something like this when you realize that people have whole farms to mine cryptocurrency, but doing it at some smaller scale is certainly still a threat. So Arctic Wolf detects this network traffic. So monitoring the input and output of network in an environment looking for, in this case, traffic to a known Bitcoin mining operation. So following our escalation procedures, after we validate what we're seeing, Arctic Wolf escalates this to the IT staff, letting them know there's a potential rogue insider or some sort of external access to this system that would be allowing this to occur. So they said, oh, great, we we found it. We found the server, isolated, uh, stopped. And we confirmed, yes, the traffic stopped. We don't see it anymore. Great, however, a couple of weeks later, Arctic Wolf noticed that it started up again. Now, this is a repeat incident. So we're going to treat it a little bit differently. We still validate what we're seeing, but we follow a slightly different escalation procedure here. Uh, it's a little bit more of a, of a problem here, especially, like I said, if we're seeing this ongoing. So we escalate to all contacts and leadership 
within the customer's um, uh, org chart, the, the contact information that we have. Long story short, customer terminates the offending employee. So when we escalated this up the chain, it was discovered that the IT administrator who had a, uh, a responded to that initial notice, uh, notification was actually the one that was doing the, the malicious traffic or mining in that case. So they of course shut that down, employees terminated. In terms of where Arctic Wolf catches this, again, deploying that serv our service, as I described earlier, um, catching those latent threats by deploying network monitoring, we're able to immediately discover, in this case, traffic to a known Bitcoining, a Bitcoin mining operation. And then also detecting that when it reoccurs. The next story I want to share with you involves the monitoring of authentication sources, in this case, Active Directory, and what happens when unauthorized modifications are made. So virtual hand raise, um, how many have an on-site auditor do routine annual testing or, or inspection of their environment? Um, in this case, a customer of Arctic Wolves was going through their annual HIPAA audit an auditor was on site. They went through a few things prior, some preliminary um, uh, meetings. Ultimately, IT cut uh, that uh, auditor an admin credential for testing. So they're like, here's the admin, here's the username, here's the password, go test our EMR platform with your tools. Now, behind the scenes, Arctic Wolf is already in place monitoring Active Directory and when we place that uh, monitoring in, um, on the environment, we're looking at changes to high security groups. Uh, in this case, we do both standard and custom. Standard being the usual suspects, domain admins, enterprise admins, schema admins, things that don't change terribly often. If they do, it could be indicators of a larger incident. But it was also customized for that customer to monitor specific groups, in this case, relating to their EMR system. So now back to our on-site audit, the concierge engineer alerted the customer that several groups associated with that EMR system had been modified. So users were added and other changes took place within that group. Again, groups that don't change terribly often. So if they do, it could be a larger incident. Now, thankfully, this wasn't malicious. But what we discovered was after escalating this to the customer, it turns out that the auditor had added themselves to that group. So as part of this testing, they added themselves into the EMR group to get the necessary permissions to go do something. But it actually <laughs> violates a security policy the auditor hadn't reviewed yet. The company immediately disables the auditor's account goes and tracks them down, lets them know the security incident. The auditor says, I shouldn't have done that. You are absolutely correct. Um, interestingly enough, it checks off several requirements in the overall audit because they're able to show we have 24 seven monitoring in place of all these crucial systems. And they effectively confirm that by violating a security policy. In terms of Arctic Wolf catching this, the second that that group was uh, modified, our group was alerted, dug into that, ultimately escalated that to the customer. The last incident or last story I'm gonna share with you here um, is one that I actually personally got to witness when I was shadowing that triage process. So again, the triage process is not just to say, hey, there's an alert, let's send that on over to the customer, but rather let's dig into this. Let's get some context, let's get some investigative detail behind this so we can ultimately determine the best course of action. So there was a new device on a customer network, in this case, a retirement home customer network um, that was connecting to some known gaming services. So Minecraft or, or Steam or Fortnite, whatever, not malicious, unusual, right? For a business network, but not malicious. What was malicious 
was the corresponding traffic for that device that was talking out to some malware sites. Ones that upon investigation were used to basically trick people. They were, you know, I'm, I, they think they're downloading a mod or an enhancement for their game, but really they're just downloading malware. So Arctic Wolf digs into this, escalates it to the customer, says, hey, we see this device on the network. It is a new device, right? I have boldened that here for you, but it is a new device that we have not seen on your network before. We know that because of DNS logs. We haven't seen that MAC address. We haven't seen that IP address. Um, and also we can see that it's not a domain joined system. So it's likely a, an external asset. Customer says, great, we're on it. We're gonna go um, find out who that is. Turns out <laughs> that it was a system belonging to a kid who's visiting a family member. So if we kind of look at that, the system, the, the kid brought a, a laptop to play video games while they were visiting family. They connected it to the internet, right? Just to the Wi-Fi, and their infected machine is now on this network. So the customer shuts them down, right? Gets, gets that machine taken off the network. Um, Arctic Wolf then flags the incident for further review during that quarterly customer meeting. Um, the question was bluntly asked, well, why can a kid put an infected asset onto your network? Ultimately led to proper guest Wi-Fi implementation, network segmentation in their care facilities. Um, the reason I want to share this is that this is, this, is a, this is an unknown, right? Someone bringing a computer onto a network, um, one that we don't manage, right? I don't have that in my domain. I don't have my EDR tool deployed on that. Um, but by monitoring the network, we can see that malicious device and act right away. Again, Arctic Wolf didn't say, hey, there's a new device talking to some gaming services, but rather there's a new device that's also talking to some malicious sites. So with that, I wanna wrap up here, make sure I give Randy some time here this morning as well, but I do wanna take any other questions that we have. I appreciate all the questions thus far. Um, but if there's any others, Greg, feel free to, uh, to to chime in. We did have a few more uh, trickle in. Um, so one of the questions, uh, we outsource our cloud and desktop support services. Do you provide a complement to this or do you provide all of these services? Not sure I understand the question in terms of outsourcing some of those services. Um, provided that you have the access to them, that you can help us get the log data from those, certainly we'd be able to interact with those or to, to monitor those effectively. Um, you know, if you're outsourcing you know, email to Office 365, you're outsourcing endpoint security to uh, a carbon black or something, absolutely we can interact with that. Uh, we might wanna take that question offline though to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Then uh, has the drastic increase in remote workers changed the type of attacks or vector of attacks Arctic Wolf has detected? Yeah, <laughs> short answer would be yes. Um, longer answer is, um, you know, tuning detection criteria to start looking at um, things like um, insecure, unsecured Wi-Fi networks that users are connecting to, or, you know, we're using our, our, our machine at home more often. So now we need to look for other potential things that could be, um, indicative of an attack. Um, certainly monitoring the upstream services that folks are using, right? Like in Office 365, for instance, um, there has been a dramatic increase in phishing attacks. Um, when we've dug into them, unfortunately, a lot of them are related to uh, stimulus offerings or, or pandemic related information. So really playing to um, you know, end user concern or end user fear, if you will, there's been a, a, a large uptick in those types of incidents. And then another question with your solution, do we have access to a dashboard or reports to see what is happening or is that all through the concierge service? Yeah, uh, again, short answer would be yes. Um, you know, there, there's absolutely a dashboard available that shows you in you know, what Arctic Wolf is working on, what incidents we're reviewing, um, giving you access to the log data we're capturing. So you also get a central spot to go through all that log data. 
Um, but the concierge security team is also available if you just have questions in terms of, you know, hey, what are you seeing? Can you generate a custom report for me? I need to see something very specific for an audit or I need to escalate something up to the board for review. So I need something very specific done. Um, so we, it's a little bit of both in that case. And there are a few more questions, but I do want to make sure we get through uh, Randy's portion of the presentation. So I think we can probably flip over to, to Randy and then we'll continue answering questions uh, following uh, Randy's presentation. Sounds good. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Thomas. Bear with me just a second as I bring up my presentation. All righty, so we'll go into this. Um, I have just five slides that I wanna present this morning. And um, I really wanna kind of tie everything together in terms of how Arctic Wolf fits into the broader concept of cybersecurity and some of the things that we're working with our, our clients on uh, to improve their operational maturity, to improve their organic security. Um, so first I'd like to start with uh, a, you know, a definition. Um, when, when we're looking at products like Arctic Wolf, I could tell you 100% this morning, every one of you could benefit in, in some way from the services that they offer, uh, but it is just one part of the overall cybersecurity discussion. And so I think it's important that we start with this, uh, this definition. And, and I, I see cybersecurity as uh, uh, information security program as a, a comprehensive set of policies, procedures, and standards that guide an organization's actions in protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the organization's uh, information assets. And so in the, in the cybersecurity profession, we refer to this as the CIA triangle. Uh, when we're talking about uh, cybersecurity, a lot of times we're thinking about hackers, we're thinking about cops and robbers, cat and mouse games, and so forth. Uh, but there are other aspects of this, uh, in confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Those are all the kinds of things that we're assessing with our clients and, and helping them get, uh, get a handle on. Uh, so some of the things that we've been seeing over the last uh, year or so uh, is that cybersecurity incidents are increasingly more common. Uh, they've become very disruptive. They've become expensive, uh, expensive for organizations. They've been uh, expensive for insurance companies. I, I do think that we're gonna be seeing a rise in insurance premiums, we're gonna be seeing some sea change in the way that insurance premiums for cybersecurity insurance are rated. Um, so, so be prepared for some of those changes that you'll see in the, in the coming years here. Uh, when, we're, when we're doing assessments with our customers, when we're engaging with them, when we're, when we're batting cleanup on some of the incidents that we're seeing out there, uh, we're seeing these trends in the industry. Uh, most organizations, many organizations haven't done a formal assessment of their information security risks. Uh, they haven't sat down and, and, I, and I think they can, they can imagine some of the scenarios that would happen. They, they, um, they want to know that they've got good backups. They want to know that they've got good firewalls, but maybe haven't thought beyond that. And so I, I think that uh, having a comprehensive discussion about this, taking into account all of the different areas of cybersecurity is, is warranted and uh, useful for organizations. Um, we're seeing that many organizations don't have full or effective logging and alerting configured. Um, there is logging and auditing and alerting available in most systems out there. Uh, in some cases, it's not turned on or the, the data retention isn't long enough for us to be able to come in after the fact and do some forensics on the uh, on the events that have happened in their environment. So reviewing that logging, making sure that it's up to snuff, making sure that it's uh, effective uh, is definitely something that I would recommend. Uh, we're seeing that uh, policies, um, policies uh, and procedures, policies underpin everything that an organization does. They inform the organization about the requirements that they have for selecting products like Arctic Wolf Networks. Um, they inform the organization where they're going to spend their money and their time in addressing cybersecurity risks. So having policies in place is, is a baseline uh, requirement that I'm seeing out there. And many organizations need some help in that area. Uh, conversations that I've been having recently around the shared risk model of cloud computing and, and using service providers in general. Um, I've had a lot of... Uh, uh, interviews with, uh, with clients where we've gone in and, and done the assessments of their cybersecurity program. 
And uh, we, we inevitably get to a, a question that, that we ask and they'll say, well, our provider is taking care of that or um, that's being done in the cloud. We don't have to worry about that. And just digging deeper into that shared risk model of cloud computing is something that I think most organizations should be, should be doing right now. They should be more aware of that. Uh, formal uh, cybersecurity awareness training is another area where we're seeing some, uh, you know, some lacking uh, in, in many organizations. That's an area that I put some focus on, educating the end users, but also educating the people that have uh, the responsibility for controlling the risks, educating the people that have the responsibility for implementing the tools and the programs. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, as we've been uh, involved in some incident response with some companies, uh, incident response policies. Uh, we, we've seen some very good incident response policies and programs out there. Uh, we've seen them entirely lacking. And in one case, we saw one where there was a very good program, but uh, it became inaccessible due to the nature of the incident. And so thinking about where to store that incident response policy and that plan, uh, those are some things that I would recommend to you. Uh, what we're doing to, to engage our customers currently is uh, we're, we do have some reactive services around incident response. We can definitely talk about those, but we're really focusing on the proactive services. Um, AWN is part and parcel of that. Uh, we're really uh, proud of our VCSO program that we've built over the last couple of years. And uh, this is something that complements uh, offerings by Arctic Wolf. It complements the assessment work that we do. Uh, we're using this as a tool to help our customers uh, get ready for ISO and, uh, and NIST compliance and CMMC compliance. And so it's a very powerful tool in that area. We start with a, an assessment and then uh, we run that program to its conclusion uh, uh, in terms of the customer's goals. Uh, we've got the comprehensive assessments that go beyond that go behind that and go beyond that. Uh, we've got the managed protection and response, Arctic Wolf Networks. We do perform vulnerability scanning. Uh, we do perform uh, penetration testing. And uh, we've got managed incident response preparedness. That's a little bit more of a proactive program where we're helping our customers uh, build that uh, incident response policy, practice that incident response plan, and make sure that they have access to it and make sure that they have access to incident response resources when the time comes. Uh, we, we're, we're working on vendor risk management, uh, manage vendor risk management. Uh, we do security policy creation and management for our customers, security awareness training, and Azure security assessments. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a coming slide here. Um, so just thinking about our, our VCSO program, again, this is complementary to what uh, Arctic Wolf provides. We begin always with an initial assessment. It's very comprehensive. We look at administrative controls, which are the people policies and processes. We look at physical controls, which as you can imagine would be door locks, lighting, um, camera systems, et cetera. We look at internal technical controls. We look at external technical controls. We pull all of that data in and we come up with a comprehensive baseline score for the organization. We then follow that with monthly engagements with our customers where we focus on building and improving their security program. And uh, our service is delivered using a fixed monthly cost model. There aren't any upfront fees with that. And the pricing is based on the size and complexity and really the goals and focus of the organization. One other thing that we've um, been, uh, been doing lately is getting on board with a new assessment tool. This is a little bit more of a tactical tool uh, designed to be kind of a quick hit to assess really the technical shortcomings of an environment or um, you know, get, get a handle on everything that's happening in the Active Directory and Azure Cloud environment. Um, so this involves scanning endpoints, scanning Active Directory and, and uh, Azure AD, scanning Office 365, SharePoint Online, Teams, et cetera, and then collecting other information through a questionnaire. Um, it's called the CSAT tool, and uh, it's a tool that was developed by a company called CS, or QS Solutions. And uh, we're partnered with them, and we're going to be giving away three of these assessments. Uh, it has about a $3,000 value. Um, so for all of those that, that have registered for this uh, seminar and have attended today, uh, you'll be put into a drawing, and we'll notify winners via email. And then our plan is to uh, deliver those assessments in the March through June timeframe. So with that, I want to close out before we get back to some more questions. 
Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you to our sponsors, Arctic Wolf Networks, Ingram Micro, and QS Solutions. And so, Greg, I'll turn it back over to you for some more Q&A. All right. Um, so we've got a few more questions in the chat. Uh, one of them being, what are some of the tools you have to educate and train company staff? Well, one of the tools that we're, um, we're using quite a bit is, uh, it's called Know Before, right? So that's, uh, that's a, a tool that Loeffler has a lot of uh, confidence in, reliance on. Uh, we have it uh, in quite a number of our client environments. We can, um, you know, we can implement it in a way that uh, our customers can manage it themselves if they have the time and the technical savvy to do that. And it doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, effort to do that once it gets all set up. Uh, but we can also manage that for our customers too, if they uh, would rather not have that, uh, uh, that burden. And uh, it's, it's more effective if it's done in an ongoing fashion. So a monthly campaign of education and testing uh, phishing users uh, or a quarterly campaign is something that would be highly recommended there. Thanks, Randy. And then another question um, directed, I think, to both Arctic Wolf and Loeffler. Since you're complementing Loeffler security services, how are your services priced by number of users, devices, venue of services, SLA levels, ETC? Okay. Well, um, Thomas, I'll, I'll push that over to you temporarily for your take on that, and then I'll try to wrap it into what Loeffler offers. Yeah, most definitely. So I kind of explained in, in depth there everything that's sort of part of our uh, solution package right uh all the log monitoring the concierge security team so that in-depth review all the escalation patterns um all of that is underneath a uh, really predictable pricing um, uh, umbrella if you will um so really all we need to know is how many users you have how many servers you have and then how many different locations where you have firewalls deployed um, so that we can adequately um, scope out, well, how much noise or how much um, data is coming from this environment and scale up on our end accordingly. Um, in, inside of that, and, and this will definitely be a great follow-up, but in terms of SLAs, right, that was the question asked there as well, um, our SLA to you on paper um, from time of detection to escalating an incident to you is 30 minutes. Now in practice, it's probably closer to five, but that includes that entire investigative process that I described, like the triage at the retirement home uh, network, for instance, all that was done in that short order um, and escalated. So that, that pricing model, um, just to get to the, you know, to the uh, answer here, that's very complementary to the Loeffler pricing model for managed services. We price based on devices and number of users. Um, and so it, it scales uh, the same way uh, that our managed services pricing does. All right. A um, couple more questions. Uh, how does Arctic Wolf compare to Cyber Reason? I've used them before and this sounds similar in many ways. Yeah, and there, there's plenty of um, uh, MDR providers out there that you can probably search for and find. Um, a few components, though, that really stand out that make Arctic Wolf um, stand out from the pack, if you'll forgive the pun, um, would be that concierge security team and the unlimited nature of our, of our log ingestion. So we're not capping you, we're not limiting you in what we can take in. And we also don't require you to swap out any of the tools or services you have already in favor of something else. Um, there's, there's a number of other things that we can really dive into that I would love the opportunity to really dig in with you on a, on a further conversation. But I would really put that concierge security team uh, at the top of the list. With that, it looks like we've gone a minute or so over our time here. Um, Thomas, I'm certainly willing to hang on and answer a few more questions if you sure. are. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So if anyone wants to continue to join us for a, a, an interactive Q&A session, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I've got the time blocked off on my calendar. Yeah, and we just have two more questions. So um, one from Dan Pierre, was the OT environments not hit as much as the IT environments from the solar winds? Uh, I'm not. Might need some clarification there. 
Yeah, that might be a good one that we can follow up on as well. Um, in terms of the environments that were impacted, uh, I mean, IT environments were certainly subject to this, right? Uh, it's where that that SolarWinds implementation was and what it had access to. So if it was on a contained network, then of course, you know, the inability to traverse outside of that. But you know, we still don't know the whole scope or, or the whole uh, impact of this incident. Like I mentioned, it's still ongoing. Um, so we're still learning in terms of who is all impacted by that. And then the last question we have is, would two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication prevented the O365 uh, breach mentioned earlier? So I will never say that you shouldn't consider multi-factor authentication in some form. Um, I think it's a, a fantastic elegant solution to um, a, a larger uh, potential incident. Uh, in the case of the, um, I believe you're probably talking about the malware bytes one we discussed, unfortunately, um, multi-factor authentication wouldn't have stopped that because the attackers actually were able to leverage pre-existing uh, authentication tokens um, that, were, that were part of that Office 365 tenant. Um, so that's where uh, two, two components would have helped out tremendously there. One being um, an in-depth review of that Office 365 tenant, because these were uh, effectively dormant old credentials that were left out there from some other deployment. Um, and then, of course, that ongoing monitoring. Um, again, Microsoft did alert Malwarebytes to that incident, but we don't know how long it was present. Um, so our ability to detect that unusual behavior um, as soon as possible is, is, is key. Don't take that as uh, as uh, license to not use MFA. I, I truly believe that anyone uh, who is using Office 365 right now should be uh, implementing MFA. They should be planning to implement MFA uh, as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, in this case, it may not have prevented that attack, but uh, it will present, prevent over 90% of all possible uh, attacks on Office 365 very easily. That's it for the, the open questions that we have. So um, I will, we will be doing a random drawing. So we will let you know um, if you've been selected and make sure we get that gift card out to you. And uh, Randy, I guess any, any closing remarks? No, just, uh, just again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone who stayed a few minutes late to ask and answer questions. Um, thank you to our sponsors, again, Arctic Wolf Networks, Ingram Micro, and uh, QS Solutions. And, uh, you know, if you have any further questions, uh, please send an email, uh, connect with us via our website, uh, connect with your, uh, your rep. And uh, we do have the... Um, DoorDash codes that will be going out to the first 50 people who regist registered for and attended this webinar. Uh, we did have more than that in attendance, so there will be a random drawing for that. And our marketing department is working on a um, uh, random drawing, for, I'm sorry, uh, a drawing for that based on the attendance. And so that will be a notification sent out via email. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>